those of you who don't know me, my name is Manny Thomas and I get to be part of the leadership team here at Epiphany Station. And we're about to jump into week two, conversation two of our teaching series on faith. But before we do, there's a couple of things that I might be able to share with you that might make you feel more welcome, especially if you're new to Epiphany. Uh, the first is, as you walked in this morning, you were hopefully handed a program along with one of our connection cards. Our connection cards are a gift to you to be able to communicate anything and everything you want to us. Whether that's just some insights, some feedback, or maybe a step you want to make or take, we want to be able to help you communicate with us. So you can fill that out. You can drop your name and a contact detail and drop that in a red box anywhere throughout the facility, and our team will follow up with that the best we know how. Uh, the second thing is we want to make sure we don't create an environment where anyone feels pressured to do anything. We want people to be self motivated and God motivated. And so, in that, when it comes to anyone who wants to contribute financially or give an offering to God here, there are three really easy ways to do that. Uh, there are red boxes spread throughout the facility. There is a tablet in the back corner of this room with a card reader attached. But if it's later on today or maybe you're watching home online, you can go to pinkpeakstation.com and give that to if you wish to. Now, like I said, we're in week two of our conversations on faith. And this teaching series, just these three conversations, are built on the desire that we have to kind of highlight and understand why there sometimes feels like there's a disparity, why there is a disconnect between what we're told about faith and what we read about faith and maybe what we experience and what we, what we see and what happens in our lives. For many, we can think that their faith is so solid, it's so secure, it's so amazing, yet for us, it can feel like we're walking a tightrope, like we at any point just kind of slip off to one side or the other. And so if there is that disparity between faiths, it's for us to understand if that's a problem, if that has been a problem, if that might be an issue, how can we understand it? How are we to understand it? Because when God talks about faith, he doesn't reveal it to us as something that is fragile or fake and fictional. When God talks about faith, he talks it being foundational, where it can't be eroded, it can't be uprooted. He talks about faith being very practical, very functional, something that you do with your life differently. He talks about faith being very fruitful, things that will change in your life, change about you, and change in the relationships you get to have with him and with people. So we're going to talk about this second one today. We're going to talk about functional faith. We're going to talk about how faith is not just for the thoughts that you might have or the feelings that you might feel, but functional faith actually brings it into the day-to-day -day practice of what you're going to do, how you're going to act, the decisions that you're going to make. Because by faith, some people have changed their world. By faith, some people have toppled injustice. By faith, some people have fed the poor and cared for orphans and counseled the lost. And by faith, people's trajectories have been changed. Marriages have been brought back from the brink. And by faith, everything has changed for a lot of people. And so that's what we want to talk about when we talk about faith actually does something, actually acts, actually changes. So we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is this entire book in the, in the latter half of the Bible, which is really this kind of stalwart bastion of this is what faith actually looks like in practice. This is what we know, this is what we can see, this is what it does. And so in Hebrews 11, it starts off with a, a definition, this kind of definitive statement of what faith is and of what we can expect. In Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2, it says that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earn a good reputation. Faith happens when something happens to you. Faith happens when a belief is held to, where something clicks, where reason and rationale tell you there must be something. There must be something worth believing in. There must be worth having faith in, even when that thing is completely unseen. And Hebrews says that faith in of itself is evidence. Evidence that there is something worth having faith in. And for those of us who want to make that the foundation of who we are, who want to love God and love people with everything, then that faith must get to realign. It must get to change who we are and therefore change our reputation to the world. See, what it says is that a faith in the unseen should lead to a faith that is then very much seen. Not something that is just kept hidden. As Hebrews continues on, it gets uber practical. And it actually starts to go through a long list of 
This is what people did because of their faith. It starts all the way back with a guy called Abel. And it says that by faith, Abel brought a more acceptable offering. And then it says, by faith, that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. It was by faith that Joseph said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel. It was by faith that the people of Israel went straight to the Red Sea. And it was by faith that the people marched around Jericho for seven days. It makes this long, this long drawn out history, this narrative of, that's faith. Faith does stuff. And the list goes on and on. You'll see in a second here. It just has to start summarizing. It doesn't have time to describe it all. But the point that's being driven home is this. Faith is not just to feel feelings. And it's not just to think thoughts. Faith does. Faith always has done and in you, in your life, any faith that you have should lead you to do. Because faith leads to acts of faith. Things that we will apply. Things that will cause us to do things differently. Things that will take our belief in the unseen and make it undeniably seen. That for our evidence that we have that there is a God that we believe in and people can't touch or taste or see, God uses who we are to show them what he does. And it seems that these two are inextricable. You can't have faith in doing and divide them. That it's as important as what a person believes as then what they do with it. And you can't have one without the other. And so the question becomes, if faith is actually a functional thing, not just logical, not just thought, not just feeling, but functional, what will that mean for you? Will that be something that you will put into practice? And if you were to do that, at your very best, at the pinnacle of functional faith, what on earth would that look like? Would it look like guys like Abel, or Enoch, or Noah? Or what about New Testament, John, Peter, and Paul? What about people like Martin Luther, or William Wilberforce? What about Billy Graham, Mother Teresa? These are people of notoriety. These are, these are celebrity Christians that we know to have lived out their faith in a way that it was worth writing about them. And I think there's a trap there. There's a trap that whenever we think of functional faith, we think of, well, a worldwide platform. We think of an album deal. We think of writing a book. We think of a stage. Rather than considering that I just named 10 people out of the billions of people that have lived by faith. I could have just as easily named 10 people in this room that live with that same kind of faith that won't have that sort of notoriety. It's important for us instead to consider what we would say was an ostentatious and flamboyant faith instead of functioning faith as something even better. And so Hebrews goes on and it actually starts to give a reality behind what faith and function can look like. It continues on in verse 32. The author says, kind of in this summary, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By their faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice. They received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions and they quenched the flames of fire and they escaped death by the edge of the sword. And women received back, oh sorry, their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. And women received their loved ones back again from death. It makes this long list of the things that were like, yeah, that, that's functioning faith. That's, that's, that's great faith, that's flamboyant faith, that's the faith that we write about and we read about and we want to talk about because that sounds glorious. But functioning faith isn't always this way. Functioning faith instead is like two sides of the same coin. One's very, very shiny, one not so much. And so when you continue in Hebrews, it's not so much. It says that there are others, others that were tortured, refusing to turn from God. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. 
and they were whipped. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stones, some by saws, and some by swords. Some of them went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Wandering around over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of this faith. All of those people, those people who were described as those making those shiny, those glorious, those fantastic achievements, and all those other people too, earned a good reputation because of the functionality of their faith, because of actually putting it into practice. That second half of that list, not so chipper, not so enticing. Not so what you'd use in evangelism, and not so comfortable to us in our westernized Christianity. But both are as equally functioning to show that God does something. Both equally function at bringing the unseen faith we have very much into the scene. And we cannot have one without the other. You will not continuously land on one side of the coin or other. Because functioning faith is not based on circumstances. Truly functioning faith faces any circumstances, no matter what comes about, and still does it, and does it differently. And the lie that has been taught and told that if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be great and peachy, is a lie. It's a lie that the church has taught, a lie that the church has to repent of. That's not the case. It's not what we see, it's not what we read. It's that functioning faith is very different, and it's better. Functioning faith can deal with anything. It is proof, whichever side of the coin you land on, whether it's the ups or the downs or the curveballs, the trials, or the blessings or the victories, functioning faith is simply your ability to live life differently. All the stories of faith that we've just accounted, the, the ten celebrities that we can think of, all these stories of faith are simply this. Every single one of them had an opportunity to give up. Every single one of them had an opportunity, maybe even a reason, maybe even a right, maybe even prudence would have told them not to do what God was calling them to do. But their faith made them not cash in their chips. Their faith caused them to do the things so very differently to the normalcy that they saw around them. And it was because of this that they were counted too good, too good for this world. One could only hope for an epitaph like that. And so by faith, they did. And it will be by faith that we ever do anything. That we ever do anything differently. That we do anything that proves the existence of God. That we live in a way that honors Him. It will be by faith that you will treat your physical body differently. It will like, be by faith that you take care of yourself. That you eat differently. That you exercise. That you rest. That you work. It will be by faith that you'll do relationships differently. They'll actually have grace in them. There'll be mercy, there'll be reconciliation, there'll be forgiveness. It'll be by faith you actually can love another human being. It'll be by faith that marriages will be distinctive. It'll be by faith that there are places of unity, of mutual submission. It'll be by faith that we parent a lot different from those around us. Not trying to point our kids at the ever shifting goals of success, but seeing what is most important and driving at that alone. It's by faith that you'll go to work different. That you'll wake up and walk through those doors and actually strive to achieve and accomplish in your vocation. It's by faith that you'll win different. That you'll win with humility. That you'll win with a credit sharing, generous mentality. It's by faith that you'll lose different. That you will lose still aware, you will fail still aware, that you will hit the wall still aware of your worth and your value far beyond anything. It's by faith that you'll do it different, because it's by faith you know that nothing else matters as much as your relationship with God. Nothing else matters as much as your faith and that connection with Him. It is by faith that we can become too good for this world. And so in practicality, we're faced with it. It's very easy to not function in your faith. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's easy to forget. It's easy to think it's too hard. But if we truly want to have a functioning faith that actually does something, that actually changes things, that actually provides, that actually serves us and serves those around us, then we must prepare ourselves for a functioning faith. 
The challenge I have for you this week is very practical. And it is to this end alone. It is not to keep going week after week after week, being hit by circumstance and situation and that knocking you from side to side, but it is instead to prepare for them. To prepare a functional faith, no matter the circumstance and situation. It's believable, and I think, why we get so many stories of such variety of people of faith. So many people in absolute, complete affluence, yet still committed to Jesus. So many people in abject poverty, yet still finding contentment. So much strain, so much hardship, so much poor health, so much division, yet still their eyes on heaven. And some of the worst treatment you could ever read about in history is in this book. Yet people still committed, still walking in their faith. And so we get these so we can see these. We get these so we can read these. We get these so we can apply these. And so I want you to ask yourself the question, how will you face life situations and circumstances? And how will you prepare yourself for them? One of my favorite Americans, and it is a growing list. It used to be quite short, but it's now getting stronger. One of my favorite Americans uh, is Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt said that unless we prepare, unless we prepare in advance, we cannot, when the crisis comes, be true to ourselves. Unless we prepare in advance, we cannot, when the crisis comes, be true to ourselves. And if being true to ourselves is genuinely leaning into this foundation of faith, that's what we need to prepare for. The crisis that can divide, the crisis that can distract us from that most important relationship. If you were with us last week for the conversation on foundational faith, you remember that I asked you to do something very different as a practical challenge, the next step. If you missed that conversation, it might help you to go back and watch it online at epiphany.com because you'll be able to see kind of what we're building here. But I'm going to challenge you to do something very similar. As you walked in, you were handed a, a blank piece of paper. And that was just to make sure you had no excuses, because you've got a blank piece of paper now, and I know you've got like 30,000 paper station pens in your car, purse, and home. Guilty chuckles. Um, what I want you to do is, I want you to look at the text that we've been walking through, the chunk, the story, the narrative about people of faith today. I want you to read it. Hebrews 11, verse 32 through 40. I want you to read it, and I want you on that piece of paper to write it out. I want you to read Hebrews 11, 32 through 40, and then I want you to write it out. And I want you to think, in those circumstances, the great ones and the not so great ones, how would I let my faith function? What would I do in facing any of those instances? And then on the bottom or on the back, I want you to get very realistic. What are the circumstances on the horizon? What are the situations that could come around? What's your greatest fear? What's your greatest worry? What's your greatest concern? Is it a relationship? Is it a situation? Is it something at work? Is it something in the family? Is it your kids? Is it your church? Is it money? Think about all the things that could be coming and plan. Plan how you're going to respond to those difficulties. Plan how you're going to continue to function in your faith when you're asked to function in your faith in a place you never thought you'd be able to. Prepare. Because God did not promise that we could have a faith that would kind of work out for us sometimes. God revealed himself to all of mankind so that we could know a relationship with him would be foundational. Unroutable. That we could have a faith that would function no matter what we face. And that even within the hardest of times, we would see fruit grow, change grow, joy, hope, and peace grow in our lives. That is the faith that God is offering for us to have. So I challenge us no longer to continue to walk in this dysfunctional, kind of maybe sometimes faith, but to commit to something that will actually live out through our lives and bring more and more evidence of the world around us. I'm going to invite the music team to come on up now. And as they do, they're going to prepare some leaders in a song of response, a song of worship, declarative of what God believes about our faith in Him and how that changes who we are and our identity. And as always, as they lead in this final song, and at the end of the experience, we'll have our prayer team down front. Our prayer team is here, specifically if you need prayer for something today, anything at all, if there's something that's wrestling with your foundation or your ability to keep functioning in your faith, they would love to pray with you. It can be for anything that you desire. And I just want to take a moment now just to pray for all of us together.
Father God, we thank you that you are, uh, that you are bigger and more mysterious and, 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 and intangible and holy than it is. It is sometimes difficult to fathom. We also thank you at the same time that you are highly practical and that you know us and you know the way that our minds and our hearts work. So you give us the opportunity the ability to see these stories of faith and, and the foundational functional faith that is lived out and is practiced and is not destroyed. So God, for those of us who desire that this morning, I ask that you would drive that into us. Give us opportunities to keep building it. To rest upon those who have gone before us and to see what they have done and how they found comfort, contentment, and peace in hardship and how they found focus in blessing and, and plenty. God, I ask that you would make of us people and, and make marriages and make families and make us a church that lives out our faith in a way that brings evidence to what you've done in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.